Welcome to What Drives You with your host, Mike Gorday. Human Solution Consultant from Seattle, Washington. It is now time to sit back, buckle up for the show that drives the asking question of what drives you. And now your host, Mike Gorday. Welcome to episode seven of What Drives You, the show about why we do the things we do. I hope you had a good weekend and are looking forward to this week. Uh, today, we are going to be talking with my first international um, guest, and that will be Nancy Oblete from West Africa. Uh, we will also be talking about beliefs and values, and we're going to talk about the question of the day. So just stick around, stay with us, and we'll be right back with our interview. And welcome back to the show. Today we are talking with Nancy Oblete of Langeria, West Africa. Did I get that right? Yes, you did. <laughs> All right. Hi, Nancy. How are you today? I'm fine. Good evening. It's a pleasure to be on the show. Great. And, uh, you know, it's morning here where I am. I'm in Seattle, Washington. What time is it there? Here is um, 5.30 thereabouts, so it's evening. All right. So this is my, you're, you're my first international guest. So I appreciate you coming on the show. Why don't you tell us about yourself? All right. So, um, I'm Nancy Oblete. Um, I'm married. I have two kids. Um, basically, I I am into um, as per career, as per study. What I studied in school was I was building construction. So I still do construction at some level, but I'm passionate about helping marriages succeed. Helping young couples find their feet, especially very early in their marriages. And then people also coming into the marriage arena to start on the right foundation so that they can enjoy the success and the bliss that is possible to have in marriage. Okay. You, you kind of took away a little bit of my thunder there because my next question was, what's your passion? But uh, how long have you been doing this type of work, uh, the the marriage counseling. Yeah, for eight years, we, we've been doing it for eight years. Uh, I started just uh, barely two years after we got married. We started understudying the count, our counselors, and from there, it has just been growing and growing. So eight years. All right, that's that's great. So. Uh, what types of, what types of things do you, do you do? Do you do premarital counseling and postmarital counseling? Do you counsel couples or individuals? How does, how does that, how does that work? Yeah. Okay. So we do premarital counseling for the couple. Usually it's best when the, both of them have the same information. Then we also do post-marital uh, conflict. We do, we have what we call um, a 14-week program for couples in crossroads. That's for couples that are having issues, are having trouble navigating one thing or the other. So they come, we have a 14-week program for them. Then we also run seminars, enrichment programs. Um, we have a WhatsApp group where people so we just have this association. Um, we share information. People are free to ask questions like that. So basically, we work with couples, intending and married couples. All right, great. So the title of the show is "What Drives You," and that's really what what I'm interested in in hearing from you uh, when you, regarding your passion. So, what do you think drives that passion? All right, uh, my drive, my drive for this started from my teenage years. My parents at some point hit a bump in the road. They had a, they, their relationship got 
got um, rocky kind of. So as a child, it was challenging being at home. I didn't want to stay home. I didn't want to experience the, the I didn't like the atmosphere. I didn't like the tension in the house. So I would always spend more time outside the home than I do at home. Once I don't have anything doing at home, I would run out. Luckily for me, because I noticed that that's where a lot of people get into many vices. But I was lucky because our church wasn't far, so I would go to church, spend my whole time in church, even if I didn't have any activity per se, I would just go to church and stay. But I remember that it was during that time I made a promise to myself, and my promise was the, that whatever it would take to ensure that I have a, a good marriage, to ensure that my children do not have to suffer what I was going through, what I and my siblings were going through, I was going to do it. So that, that kind of drove us, even when we came into uh, counseling to learn, I was hungry. My husband too had, had, had had his own experience. So we were both passionate, willing and open to learn as much as we could so that we ensure that our journey in the marriage uh, arena would be successful. So right now that passion has grown beyond just me to a desire to see more homes work, more homes succeed. Our slogan, the tagline we use is make, making the world a better place, one family at a time. Because mm -hmm. I, I discovered that most of the challenges we have in the world, like we, we are talking about um, um, juvenile delinquencies, we are talking about rapes, arsons, and all that. The, the family has a lot to do to be able to help people um, come out well, or at least have very little dysfunction so that they don't go into those vices. And even research shows that children that are from single homes are more prone to get into these vices. So mm -hmm. it's, it's my desire, my passion, that we secure as much homes as possible. Because once people get married, especially when they start having children, it's no longer about them really. It's about... So, it sounds like... It's no longer, like... sorry, my kid. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's all right. Okay. So it's no longer about them really. It's now about the environment. It's now about the community because I, I, once they have kids, these kids will leave home and the family is the first unit, the first unit that raises them, that shapes them to hit the world. So if they don't get that proper grooming, then the world will suffer for it. The world will not be, will, will uh, reap the repercussions of what happens privately at home. So that's my passion to help people have that home so that we make the world a better place. Oh, wow. That's fantastic. Uh, you certainly, you certainly do show that, that passion when you start talking about that. And you've been doing this for eight years. I assume that uh, you're going to do this for 18, 28, 38 years, right? Sorry, I didn't get that. Oh, I said uh, you've been doing this for 18 or eight years, and I assume that you're going to do it for 18 years, for 28 years, for 38 years. Is that, is that uh, what you For you're... the rest of my life. Okay. <laughs> for All as right. long as I live, yeah. <laughs> All right. That's great. Well, thank you for sharing that. Um, we don't have too much more time left in this segment. Uh, one of the things that I'd like to ask my guests is if they have a, a human behavior question that, that I might have a perspective on. And, you know, it's, it's about basically like if you ever looked at somebody and went, why did they do that? That's kind of what I like to try to figure out. So do you have a question for us today? Yeah, I, I, I do. Uh, I've, been, I've been looking into um, depression, right? Why mm -hmm. people get depressed. And sometimes I'm, I've been able to understand, maybe you, you are able to, I'm able to look into their 
their world and see this didn't go right, that didn't go right. But there are other times I'm not really able to understand where, why, how this person got into this depression and why they, they couldn't share it, even with people that were around them, that were available, that loved them. And so I don't know if you, if you do have some perspective to that. Hmm. Yes, that's uh, that's a that's a little complicated, uh, you know, because there's there's a medical model model that suggests that it's a chemical imbalance in the brain. H however, there has to be something that gets us to that that medical model. And a lot of times uh, from a psychological perspective, uh, depression is repressed anger. You know, we get angry and we don't show it and we get and we push it way down. So that's one perspective uh, that uh, we're trying to deal with our circumstances and we're trying to deal with it without getting angry or we're pressing that down and it's starting to create this system of self-defeat. And we sometimes succumb to it. And that's where all that uh, listlessness comes from. You know, it's, we have this, uh, we can say energy that, that we tie up into holding that to get, trying to hold that down. And that becomes our, that becomes our way of being, you know, so, so we're so busy trying mm -hmm. to hold all that stuff in that, that that's where all of our energy goes. So that's, that's another perspective of this. That's, uh, that's a pretty complicated thing, and it it can take a lot of of energy to get out of that. So that may not help you a whole lot. But uh, did that answer part of your question? Yeah, yeah. You know when you when you talked about um, anger, that's holding in anger. I could relate because I, I, I have had opportunity to talk to one or two people that have been depressed. So it just makes sense to say, especially for one in particular that I talked with, she had been in this abusive relationship for years and because of beliefs, because of um, tradition, mm -hmm. she couldn't speak up, not even to her own people. Yeah, so I, I could just... Um, see that how um, that anger she had been holding in could have resulted in her becoming depressed. Yes, yes. And I, I think the, I kind of have the opinion that the medical model follows the emotional model because, because we don't, there has to be something that triggers these emotional states first. So when we get into these emotional states in our the, the thing about our brain is that our, our brain adapts to the situation that it's in. Uh, mm -hmm. And it does that because it's trying to help you survive. So uh, what, I, what I believe is that uh, when we put ourselves into this emotional state over and over again, whether it is because we're repressing anger or because of a sense of loss or whatever it is, uh, that that's what changes our brain chemistry. And the more we stay in that system, the more our brain changes to accommodate that. And then uh, from that medical aspect, we tend to say, okay, we, well, we just need to train. We just need to change the brain chemistry. So we, we're going to give you drugs. And then we don't necessarily focus on the emotional states that created that situation in the first place. So yeah yeah that's so true that's so true because I'm, i met people especially here where i stay in, in africa is is even worse like like the woman i mentioned i asked i said did your psychiatrist ever ask why did he ever engage you to find out what's happening and all and the answer was a no Yes. He didn't. He just gave her drugs, diagnosed her, and and started giving her drugs. And it was really sad to see that happen. Yeah, it, it often it often takes. I mean, it's not that I don't have a problem with the drug aspect, but it often takes more than that to to help 
relieve a lot of the symptoms and then have that person get out sometimes because you know people are people and some people will do it on their own uh, some people will rely on the medication only some people will do both uh, it just really depends on the person their knowledge their experience and their personality yeah oh, interesting all right. Okay. Well, that's that's it for today. Uh, I want to uh, thank you for joining me today. I really appreciate you coming on the show. Thank you so much for having me. Um, I, I'm thrilled. I'm excited that I was able to do this. Thank you. Oh, you're absolutely welcome. <laughs> So thank you guys for for sitting with me and Nancy today. We will come back with our our regularly scheduled segment where I talk a little bit about whatever I'm going to talk about, and then we'll end the day with the question of the day. So stay tuned. Um, we'll see you in a minute. Thank you very much. And we're back. Uh, thanks for joining us today, Nancy. I hope things go well for you. Um, today, we're going to talk a little bit about uh, beliefs and values. Now, we've been uh, we've been building sort of a, a viewpoint of what a person's inner world is like, uh, from the most basic parts of our brain work, which is the pleasure pain center, through. Uh, perceptual lenses and then we, we come to this point where we have beliefs and we have values uh, these are well what are they that's a good question uh, beliefs are assumptions of about ourselves and about the world around us uh, they are created through past experience, through knowledge that we've gathered, through how people have treated us, through how people have taught us things. Uh, and values are really the standards by which we measure things that are things that are important to us. So oftentimes our beliefs can inform values. Now, when we talk about beliefs, uh, they are really assumptions. There need not be any proof per se that a belief is true. And we can look at this from uh, a viewpoint of uh, whether you believe in God or not. We can also look at this through the viewpoint of whether you believe you're a failure or not. And here's the problem with the belief. Again, the, the belief is, is exist as a function of your own assumptive collecting of knowledge. Now, what I mean by that is that uh, when I hold something to be true, regardless of whether or not, let's, let's pretend like uh, uh, we use the example of the sky is really not blue, the sky is green. I think I talked about that last week or at least on uh, another show. Um, if I believe that the sky is green rather than blue and we all can look at that from an objective standpoint and say well that's wrong but it's my belief and here's what i do to create that belief in my psyche my brain is programmed by the belief the belief says the sky is green for so what for whatever reason may, maybe my parents taught that to me maybe that maybe that's some kind of weird thing that they did they said no no son the sky the the teachers are wrong the sky is green and i want to believe them over my teachers because why because i want to be accepted by my parents over my teachers so i believe it now, what my brain does is as it installs this belief in my, in my unconscious, it starts doing what is called evidence collecting. It collects all the evidence that supports that belief. And we call this a cognitive bias. And in this case, this would be confirmation bias, which I have also spoken about uh, several times. So uh, confirmation bias is collecting evidence that supports a belief or a process and generally speaking ignores 
evidence to the contrary. So if I believe that the sky is green, I'm going to find all the evidence that I need to, to prove that. And it might, it might be something as simple as, uh, no, everybody else has the wrong color choice. It really is green. Two, uh, some very complex system of saying, well, the way the light refracts through the atmosphere, uh, we perceive it as these color spectrum but what it actually is is this color so we can we can do all these kind of tricks and we can therefore create a more solid belief system around that are you following because this is this is important when we talk about beliefs that are well they're they're pretty solid Beliefs are very powerful for us in, in our human nature, and they inform how we behave, and we in, they inform the values that we value. They, inf, they infer from our experience, and they give credence to our experiences. That's how we get into trouble with things like racism or gender in, gender issues or uh, even personal things like if I believe I am a failure, which is very common, especially in our society today, where failure is a horrible thing that you should never, never do. If I believe that I'm a failure, my brain is going to find this, the evidence to support that. And it's going to get rid of any evidence to the contrary. Believe it or not, a lot of overachievers have a fundamental belief that they are failing, which is why they overachieve. So they go out, they overachieve, they overachieve, they overachieve, but it's never good enough because that, that piece in there says, well, you're a failure. You have to work harder. Uh, that doesn't matter. That's how it works. See? So this is how this this is how this problem perpetuates some some of our personal issues as well as a lot of our social issues is is these these belief systems that we create through our lives from our group identities and from our personal identities and experiences. Now our values are the standards by which we measure and think of as important to us. And oftentimes our values will uh, come from our belief systems. So when we talk about uh, things like what religion and believing in God, uh, part of that part of that is believing in the tenets of that religion, which you can break down into common values, like honesty, family, giving back, forgiveness. Those are all values that are part of that belief system and it informs that system and that system informs the values. So that's a, that's a distinction between beliefs and values. And we create our attitudes and behaviors from these macro systems of belief and values. And that's how we enter the world. And that's a lot of how we interact with other people. Now, I mentioned uh, in previous episodes, uh, I can't remember if it was the last episode or the episode for that, that uh, because we are looking for acceptance from other people, that we tend to externalize our belief systems on everybody. If I believe it, it should it's, it's true. And we can go back to the case of of the sky is green. If I am, have such a, a very strong conviction that the sky is green, I want everybody else to believe it too. So I'm going to externalize my beliefs onto them. And when they don't give me that belief back, I'm going to start having conflict because I need them to uh, affirm my beliefs and I need acceptance from them. So it, it's, it creates, it, it's one of the things that creates conflicts. And depending on how convicted I am on that belief, that can create more and more problems. 
And we see this, we see this very easily in people who convert to religion for the first time, you know, uh, they, they start going out and they're very, very fervent about trying to get people to believe what they believe because they, and they, they believe they're doing what they're supposed to be doing. They believe everything is, is the way it should be, but they are, they're essentially externalizing their belief system on us. And we all do this. And it's not just religion either. It's personal beliefs. It's family beliefs. Uh, it's social beliefs, right? So if we look at, we look at things like traditional family values versus liberal values. These are belief systems that we try to externalize on everybody and it causes us conflict. When the point, the, the, the matter of fact piece of this is that these are things that we would like to live by. We don't necessarily need to externalize it. The only reason why we're externalizing it is because we want, we need people that are like us. We need that similarity with other people. So we, we look for people that believe the same things we do. We try to make sure that people who believe differently start believing the way we do. And we do, we act out those through the drama that we see in our everyday lives. We see it right now in the political storm that we are going through. We see it with the COVID stuff. Um, that's the culmination of almost everything I've been talking about is this behavior of, of interacting with other people. So beliefs and values, those, those are, that's the distinction between beliefs and values. That's, that's part and parcel to what makes our personality. That's what makes up our attitudes and our behaviors. And I'm going to stop right there. Uh, I don't think we need to really go into that uh, more deeply because I think I think that that gives you a pretty good idea of what what these things are. Beliefs are are the convictions that we hold our hold to be true about ourselves and the world around us, and values are the standards by which we measure those beliefs and what we find important to us. So, all right, stick around. We're going to move from here to our question of the day, and uh, we'll be right back. Welcome back. Today is the question of the day, and that comes from Sherry in Arizona. And her question of the day is, how do I motivate myself to do things I don't like? Well, before I answer, those of you who have been listening to this podcast for the se last several weeks, what do you think? Can you, can you see what, what's going on here? Can you, can you kind of understand how that's placed in all the things that I've been talking about? If not, let's talk. Um, motivation. That's a big thing in our society, uh, especially if you look into the world of work and the world of entrepreneurship or anything. Motivation is huge. Motivation is huge in the health industry. Motivation, 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 motivation. What is motivation? Well, if we look at it from a chemical place, that's really our reward system in action. That's, that's dopamine in our brains. Anytime we do something, we get a dopamine reward from it. So when we repeat something, we get a dopamine reward for it. The key to that is that we keep doing it. We keep giving ourselves dopamine rewards. And that is essentially what motivation is. Dopamine is a motivation creator. The more dopamine we have associated to a task, the more likely we're going to do that. Well, how do we get that motivation? Well, here's, here's the second key point to that question. How do I motivate myself to do things I don't like? What's the key point there? There's pain involved. And what is it that we don't want to do? Our, our essential function of our brain is to say, no, don't do that. And because we've attached negative beliefs around it or negative 
connotations around let's 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 say it's washing dishes because I know everybody loves to wash dishes. How do I motivate? How do, how do I motivate myself to wash dishes when I don't like them? Well, uh, I can do it one of two ways. I can just do it and make myself do it every day. Right? I can. I I know some of you have probably done this. Do you like washing dishes? Probably not because that doesn't address the second point. It does address the first point because every time we repeat that, it gets easier for us to do it. However, if we're always putting negative judgments on it when we do it, if I, if, I go, if I go to wash the dish, wash the dishes, and I get angry about it and start cussing, and rah, 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 this is not fair and blah, blah, blah. I'm, all I'm doing is heaping more pain on it so that uh, there's more of a chance that I'm not gonna do it tomorrow especially if I'm, I live with roommates that don't wash dishes, right? How many of you have, have had this happen where you live with a group of people, whether you're in college or what, and the dishes don't get washed. And there's always one person who's always doing the dishes. And that one person usually hates doing it, but they have to do it because they need to keep, the, they need, they need that cleanliness factor. That cleanliness factor is more important to them than hating to do the dishes, but they do the dishes and they just, call down curses from heaven on everybody around them that that dirties those dishes so it makes it makes this task more painful to do the more negative energy we heap onto it so what do we do for that well we can address the hate part the fact of the matter is is that washing a dish is really just a task. What are the negative things around it? Well, my my parents used to make me do it as a child, and I always hated that. Okay, well that's an that's an emotional that's an emotional uh, association that you can get rid of. You can change that. You can actually teach yourself to love washing dishes, so that when you do wash dishes, it's not such a huge deal. In fact, you can create a, a system that you love to wash dishes so much that you're actually doing more dishes than anybody else. Or you're, I mean, this is, this is how we, this is how we adapt to situations. Part of it is just doing it. Just doing it's going to build up a motivation factor of that dopamine. Uh, but putting, putting enjoyment into it, you increase the motivational factor. So how can you put some stuff, some positive stuff around it? Well, you could take time out of your day and listen to music while you're doing. I know people who turn on the radio and dance while they do dishes. So not only are they doing the tasks that, that they may not want to be doing, they're also enjoying some music and they're getting their bodies physiologically involved in the task. Okay. Do you see what I'm, where I'm coming from with this? This is how, this is how children in school can learn how to like school is by associating what they like with a like associating what they like with what they are doing. So if they hate math, but they love, I don't know, magic, the gathering. And I know that that has a lot of numbers involved. If you can teach them math through that thing, they are going to learn math better than if you just teach them math. And I know that's a, that's a stretch a little bit because, you know, when a, a school setting, you have, you can't, you can't just be individually teaching everybody, but this is, these are ways that we can look at things differently. How do you associate positive behaviors with the task that's necessary, that, that's necessary to do? So Chris, they, she, no, Sherry, I'm sorry. Sherry, if you have something that you don't like to do, figure out why you don't like it and figure out what you can do to make it more enjoyable and then do it. And then make sure you reward yourself for doing it. And over time, you will build up the motivation to keep doing it. You will habituate that task behavior. And it will 
become a part of how you do your daily life. I hope that answers your question. Uh, I, I hope it was simple enough. Um, you know, if you do have questions about human behavior or what you can do, uh, send me an email at mike at whatdrivesyou.net. I'm always happy to receive questions from you. Um, I may not have the answers right away, but I, I will look into them. Uh, until next week, have a great weekend. See you then. Bye-bye.